Welcome one and all to this NPTEL lecture on application of characterization technique to assess composite binders with limestone calcium clay cement. So, uh, I am Yuvraj, a PhD student working with Professor Manu. So, in this lecture what I will uh, try to talk about is use of the techniques which we have discussed until this point in the class and look at ways in which we can apply these techniques to a uh, new cementitious system and try to evolve understanding. So, by now most of you would have understood use of characterization technique is uh, supportive to finding answers to key questions in research. So, the first point is to understand or ask questions to find out what you want to analyze. Uh, there is a famous English proverb which says the proof, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So, first you want to find out what you want to explain in terms of property, ask the question of what you want to characterize, then why you want to characterize like whether is it is it because of any significant difference in the property and then that will lead you to uh, answers or precise answers in choosing the technique how you want to characterize. So, for the online viewers uh, prerequisite before taking this lecture would be uh, I would expect you to have covered the XRD lecture by Professor Piyush and the microscopy lecture by Professor Manu and also some background reading on limestone calcine clay cement which I will explain right now would be also required. So, this will be the scheme of things which will be covered in today's lecture. First I will give you background and introduce what is the new limestone calcine clay cement system uh, after which we will uh, try to look at the role of characterization techniques in particular XRD and SEM techniques to address range of different problems when you are working with research questions. For instance, in XRD it, it can be used to uh, narrow down on material processing, formulations of binders to study, assess phase assemblage and also to explain durability behaviors. And then we will uh, move into microscopy and look how uh, microscopy techniques can be used to assess material composition, microstructure, physical and the chemical state, role of curing which involves assessing uh, role of curing duration as well as curing temperature and role of binder chemistry which can be assessed using EDAX uh, to explain hydration and durability behavior. A brief background about the system before we start dwelling into different techniques, uh, limestone calcine clay cement uh, is a composite binder which is made of clinker, calcine clay, limestone and gypsum. So, most of you would, would be aware a typical a blended cement which is called Portland Porcelain cement, PPC cement, PPC cement which is available in market is generally composed of clinker, fly ash and gypsum. So, in this uh, binder which is called LC3, we have clinker which is a major component which is brought down to about 50 percent. Then you have calcine clay which is about 30 percent. So, these are empirical we can work out with the formulations and then you have limestone which is about 15 percent and then you have gypsum which is typically about 5 percent. So, when you have range of different uh, components within the binder there are multiple reactions which happens. So, you need to address these in interactions and understand what is the implication of this composite structure or uh, on the final performance. So, for instance uh, uh, this is a typical hydration curve of uh, cementitious system generally what happens is uh, initially you have a dormant period hydration products start forming when setting occurs. Initially there is formation of CSH, so you call it early CSH and uh, along with which you also form ettringite. Right? And uh, post uh, the initial period if you uh, do not have limestone in the systems, the ettringite amount start dropping. But when you have calcite particles within the system, the ettringite amount which is formed initially is sustained, right. It is because the calcite particle would react with the excess aluminates and form additional hydration products which are called mono and amy carbo aluminates. Along with which, uh, with which when you have calcine clay which is a pozzolan, you also have a traditional pozzolanic reaction which occurs in most of the blended cements. So, when you have multiple reactions happening pa in parallel which is acceleration of clinker reaction because you have limestone in it which tends to accelerate the reaction of clinker, stabilization of ettringite which I have uh, discussed here when you have calcite particles it tends to react with the alumina and form additional 
uh, hydration products called carboaluminate. So, you do not necessarily convert the ettringite to monosulphate and lowered portlandite because you have calcine clay which is a pozzolan. So, portlandite amount tend to get lowered and finally, there is increase in pozzolanic CSH and CASH. So, characterization technique in particular can be as, as uh, used to assess range of different characteristics. For instance, what is the change in these hydration products which are available, right? And also, what is the change in porosity, which is a physical structure, right? So, I have tried to uh, list the range of different application in which uh, characterization technique can be used. For instance, uh, if you look at XRD, it can be used to identify suitable clay which has to be used in the calcine clay based binder, right? what is the composition of the clay, how much is the kaolinite content in the clay and by heat treating the clay which is you heat the clay and decompose it, how much is uh, of the clay is decomposed, what are the formulations which have to co come up with when you are having these multiple components, right? is there a necessity to add or adjust the binder formulations, what is the influence of proportioning? Like when, when you have different proportions of these compounds, for instance, difference in the limestone calcine clay ratio, how it is going to alter the final phase assemblage? How are these phases which are formed affected by curing temperature? And we are also looking at additional phases which are not necessarily available in typical blended cement. In typical blended cement, we always look at formation of additional pozzolanic CSH. Here we are looking at different hydrates, whether these are stable over the period of time. Right? Once it is formed, for instance, after several years, whether these hydrates are going to be stable. So, there is no loss in property. What is the degree of hydration of the different phases which are there in cementitious system? How are these phases responding when you expose it to aggressive environment? It can be sulphates, chloride, carbonates. What is the tendency of it to transform and lead to any change in behaviors? Right? So, these are different schemes in which XRD can be applied. When you look at SEMs, for instance, whether there is any difference in the microstructure itself, what is the characteristics of porosity, what is the chemical composition of microstructure. So, we discussed about uh, pozzolanic CSH, right. So, when you have fly ash and calcine clay, is there any difference in the pozzolanic CSH which is formed? Again, what is the role of curing temperature, which is very critical in governing the performance in practical conditions? whether there is any difference in the assemblage of this uh, hydrates in the capillary pore space and what is the variations which is uh, occurs due to exposure in durability environments, right. So, we will go through one uh, each of this uh, techniques and try to ask the question uh, which tool is idle or how the tool has been applied to understand the processing efficiency or the performance parameter in all this situation. For example, uh, if you take material processing, so I have given you uh, X-ray diffractograms of raw and calcine clay. So, in raw clay, you see this peak here in XRD, right. So, this belongs to kaolinite uh, peak. So, when you heat treat kaolinite, right, the kaolinite tend to decompose and form an amorphous material, right, which, uh, which is an idle pozzolan. So, in, if you want to uh, uh, test whether the cal uh, clay has been calcined properly, XRD can be used very efficiently to check the ca uh, kaolinite peaks. So, for instance, these two peaks which you see here belongs to kaolinite content. So, if the peaks uh, of kaolinite are completely decomposed after heat treatment, then the calcination efficiency has been proper. Right? And also, uh, the other component in the limestone calcine clay cement binder is calcite. Right? when you look at calcite or the raw limestone which is available in feed near the uh, as deposits near the cement plant, it can have range of different calcium carbonate phases. So, for instance, you can have a calcite phase, you can have a dolomitic phase which is magnesium calcium carbonate, not necessarily pure calcium carbonate and you have an aragonite phase which is a different phase of calcium carbonate. So, I have listed the diff peak intensity of this three different phases of calcite itself. So, when you are trying to come up with formulations for new binder, you want to have limestone in it, you tend to uh, see what are the phases present in limestone, what form it is present. So, for example, uh, when you have calcite and dolomite, the reaction or the expansion in your systems can be completely different because magnesium can tend to produce expansion in your system. So, you need to characterize the raw material before being used. Also, the purity of the material which is used. For instance, I have given you a diffractogram of uh, limestone here. If you look at uh, 
the diffractogram, you can see presence of quartz in it, which shows that the limestone uh, uh, which is presented here or assessed is not pure per se. So then you need to assess what is the quality of the limestone. So that can alter the reactions or extent of reaction of limestone with your calcine clay. So uh, basically the question was uh, when you heat treat the clay what are the changes in the XRD peak. So the black line which you see here is the raw clay where you see the kylinite peak which is this one and this one right. When you heat treat the clay kylinite tend to decompose and form amorphous aluminosilicate. So you do not see the kylinite peak right. So when you are doing a laboratory processing for instance why material processing is important is so when you are try, trying to formulate uh, such materials or process the material in different conditions in laboratory conditions how do you identify what is the suitable temperature to be used or the dwelling time which has to be used. So for instance I have presented here decomposition of the kylinite peaks in different conditions. So the clay as received you can see very strong peaks of kylinite right. And then when we try to process it, we want to heat treat it. So uh, it has been heat treated in a furnace where you can uh, tend to take it to anywhere between 600 to 800 degrees Celsius. Theoretically at 600 degrees Celsius, kylinite should decompose. But when you start having large volumes of material, the decomposition will not be uniform. In that case, what we should do is assess the material like for instance here the sample has been taken from the surface of the furnace right, and from the core. Right. So when you start taking material from core and surface, what you can see is at the surface the kylinite peak is almost fully decomposed, but at the core because heat has to be transmitted till the core of the material, you still have a strong kylinite peak. So when you start seeing such behavior, what you need to ensure is you uh, up the temperature or increase the dwelling time for in th uh, this case like the temperature was increased to nearly 820 degrees Celsius to reduce the amount of kylinite peak which is present. So you tend to calcine the clay properly in those cases. Right. So laboratory process like this can be optimized by suitably using the characterization technique at uh, right, uh, 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 right point in time. You do not want to end up an uh, using an uncalcined clay directly into uh, your concrete or binder formulations which may lead to uh, absorption of water or expansion crackings and, uh, uh, for example. So the other process is once the material has been processed coming up with formulations also will require characterization at suitable uh, requirement. For instance you have calcine clay which is basically an aluminosilicate right. So you tend to have excess alumina into your binder. So when you start having excess alumina uh, what I have presented here is a calorimetric curve of calcine clay binder which different dosages of cal uh, calcium sulphate hydrate which is gypsum. So when you start increasing gypsum dosage you tend to push the aluminate peak, the second peak belongs to the aluminate right after the consumption of sulphate. So when you start adding excess sulphate to the system you tend to push the aluminate peak. So you can see here I have presented calorimetric curve of system without, uh, uh, without, gypsum, uh, without gypsum and with gypsum. So when you look at the difference the one with uh, gypsum much produces a much broader silicate peak and one without gypsum tend to have a very abrupt uh, drop after the initial hydration curve because when you do not uh, provide sufficient gypsum to your systems it can hamper with your calcium silicate tricalcium silicate reactions so it can bring down your reaction extent. So in these cases when you are dealing with such binder formulations you need to increase the gypsum dosage. However when you start overdosing gypsum to systems what it does is it keeps the sulphate ion saturated in your pore solutions. So when you still have the sulphate ions, so I was talking about reaction of cal uh, limestone into your systems right. So when you start having sulphate ions it will hamper or suppress the reaction of your carbonates into your uh, system. So you do not necessarily produce the ideal kind of binder formulation which is desired right. You come up with the mixture of calcine clay, limestone or clinker but if you overdose uh, sulphate by some extent it will uh, not allow the uh, limestone to react. So very simply what you can do is check an XRD right. So what I have given here is dotted line is an XRD peak of a gypsum right and when you check XRD uh, this was done at 3 days. So when you check XRD at 3 days what we tend to see is almost uh, 
the consumption of gypsum which is not present, gypsum tend to dissolve initially. Also the formation of carboaluminate peak, here in this case hemi carboaluminate which is half molecule of carbonate. So once you see formation of carboaluminate that just confirms that you have not overdosed gypsum to such an extent that you are suppressing the carbonate reaction. So this can very easily help you to come up with formulation which are more idle in, uh, in the case of uh, limestone calcine clay and clinker. Right? So you have to check for the carboaluminate peak at the early age to ensure that gypsum is not overdosed and sulphate is not kept saturated in post solution. Right? The next zone once you have processed the material you have tried to uh, confirm the binder formulations are right. The next characteristics which we can try to address or understand is what is the change in the phase assemblage. So when we say phase assemblage what are the compositions of the phases which are formed. So for instance here I have pre presented uh, the phase assemblage of a fly ash binder which is more typical most of you uh, would understand what a fly ash binder is and a LC3 binder. So let, let us go through the differences for instance here you tend to see Portlandite content and Portlandite content is stable almost at 15 percent until the age of 28 days. And then if you look at the ettringite amount initially ettringite amount is at reaches about uh, 10 percentage later it tends to drop which is more, more or less expected because you do not have limestone in such system. So as I told before the ettringite amount tend to get reduced because it get converted over the period of time to monosulphate. But if you look at the calcine clay limestone based system you can see the ettringite amount increasing and almost remaining stable from that point at around 10 to 12 percentage. Right? This is because when you have limestone the ettringite amount tend to remain stable. Also interesting observation would be you can see the Portlandite content which is almost at 6 percent ultimately at around 4 percent in the case of calcine clay binder whereas in fly ash you tend to see very high amount of Portlandite. This also confirms the reactivity of the material. So since calcine clay is highly reactive it tend to consume lot of Portlandite uh, which is present at a very early age and you can also see the amount of uh, carboaluminate reactions which are forming. So for instance here the carboaluminates which are forming which is semi carboaluminate tend to uh, rise from nearly 1 percent to 7 percentage and remain stable. Right? So in this way you can characterize the material and make sure the formulations are in line with the theory which is expected behind the uh, interactions. Right? The Portlandite will be consumed by fly ash over the period of time. So here what I have presented is up to 28 days. Right? So we know that fly ash is a less reactive porcelain. So it tend to react much slowly after the 28 days. There is an increase in the yeah. little bit increase. Yeah. At the early ages you tend to have only the dilution effect like clinker is reacting over the period of time. So I will show you later some diffractograms of uh, fly ash concretes at 150 days and uh, 4 years where we tend to see a complete consumption of Portland. Right? So why is this important? Why we want to assess what is the governing phases or the amount of phases which is produced. So for instance here what I have presented is the cumulative volume of the solid phases. So we have, uh, we have different phases produced. right? So when you have phases what it finally end up doing is it all forms solid and all the solid which is produced or the hydrates which is produced imp, uh, tend to fill up the porosities. right? But what, what is different between the different hydrates is the density of the phases. Right? So when the density of the material is lower, right, the volume filling capacity is high. Right? So for instance, the, uh, you can observe here the, the volume of uh, ettringite, uh, monocarbonate and hemicarbonate which comes to round about uh, 6 uh, centimeter cube in the case of LC3 binder. Right? So when you look at uh, Portlandite and the other phases in this cases the overall volume of these phases tends to be around 4 centimeter cube. Right? So when you have higher volumes of these phases because of the density of the phases right, these phases tend to have lower density for instance ettringite has a density of around 1.6 right? carboaluminates have a density around 2 your CSH has a density around 2.1 to 2.2 right? and your calcium hydroxide has a density of around 2.223. Right? So when you have phases with lower density for instance you have more amount of ettringite it tends to fill up the solid volume much more uh, better than the other phases. So what happens is you have a cement grain 
right you tend to produce uh, CSH around the cement grain. So when you have these uh, phases which are having lower density the convergence of this uh, reaction products in the uh, capillary region will be much more right. So this can be used to address such uh, behavior like when you have conversion of a system which is dominated by calcium hydroxide and ettringite and later it is getting dominated by your ettringite and carboaluminates. So it can have a completely different level of property development because of the difference in the solid volume right. So uh, we have seen that it can change the solid volume but how it can help us theorize lot of knowledges in terms of fundamental research questions. So for instance here I have presented x-ray diffractograms of calcine clay binder. So this is binary calcine clay at 30 percent and calcine clay at nearly 42 percent. You have calcine clay limestone at 10 percent, 15 percent limestone and 20 percent limestone right. So what you can observe is in the cases where you have limestone you tend to see an rise in the ettringite peak because limestone preserves this ettringite which is formed. Also when you uh, start forming higher amount of uh, adding higher amount of limestone to your systems. So you tend to vary the amount of monocarboaluminate and hemicarboaluminate which is formed right. So when you have more calcite you tend to form directly monocarboaluminate. When you have less calcite you tend to form hemicarboaluminate which gets converted progressively to monocarboaluminate. So when you consider it along with curing conditions for instance this is at an early age which is at 3 day when you look at 28 days you can see a rise in the hemicarboaluminate peak right for some systems but when you start looking at later ages with higher amount of uh, uh, limestone in it the phase which is more stable is monocarboaluminate. So when you have more calcite particles in your system it tends to progressively convert all your hemicarboaluminate into monocarboaluminate right. So this lead to changes in the uh, phase assemblage with respect to curing. Also this can help us analyze uh, what is the role of aluminates right or silicates for instance. The aluminates tend to react uh, and go form CSH right or form hydration products like carboaluminates. So what I want to bring your attention to is uh, uh, the binary binders which has only calcine clay right. If you look at it you start seeing a peak in this zone at around 7 degree right which indicates the formation of stratlingite. Stratlingite is CASH where alumina to silica ratio is 1 right. So when you have alumina to silica in the ratio of 1 and there is a CAS uh, in the CASH that phase is called stratlingite. So when you do not have limestone to your system the there is excess aluminates which are available. So naturally the aluminates start reacting and start moving into your CSH and end up finally forming a stratlingite phase right. So slowly aluminates are moving for instance you, you can see here when you have higher amount of calcine clay 40 percent uh, even at 28 day you start seeing signs of stratlingite. When you have only 30 percent calcine clay stratlingite amount is lesser. When you have 40 percent calcine clay at 128 uh, 20 days you can see a very st stable stratlingite phase right. So when you start adding limestone to it you do not see any formation of stratlingite because all the aluminates are consumed in the formation of carboaluminates right. And also what we can observe is the role of uh, pozzolanic reaction which is the reaction of silicates as well as aluminates. So what you can see is the dominant consumption of portlandite at different region right. So you can it can be quantified to explain how much of portlandite is consumed or how much of calcine clay is reacted. So for instance uh, when you have only 30 percent calcine clay because you have higher amount of clinker in it you see signs of portlandite present even at uh, 120 days All in the other cases you do not see signs of portlandite right. This can also help us understand why stratlingite is forming in some conditions. So thermodynamically stratlingite is stable only if the system is defective of portlandite there is no portlandite in the system. So when portlandite is completely consumed you start forming higher amount of stratlingite in the system right. The next, next aspect like we can understand how the structure is developing different phases are forming the other uh, is to ensure that these phases are stable over the period of time. So you make concrete uh, 
you make critical infrastructure with such new binder formulation and expose it to natural environment for a long period of time, right. So, the phases which are formed should be stable uh, in, in those conditions. So, in, in case of research when you are coming up with new formulation trying to address it, it is necessary to ensure that the phases remain stable or what is the change in phases that become an in, interesting point of contention, right. So, long term stability of the AFM indicates alumina, iron, mono uh, phases or tri phases, right. AFT is ettringite and AFM is uh, monocarbonate, hemicarbonate and monosulphate. So, here I have presented uh, x-ray uh, diffractograms of uh, uh, plain Portland cement fly ash cement and an LC3 cement at about 150 days. So, what you can see is higher amount of hemicarbo aluminate compared to monocarbo aluminate. So, these are x-ray diffractograms at about 4 years where the system was not cured, just sealed just like your concrete and kept in the con uh, Chennai conditions. So, at 4 years when you tend to see the hemicarbo aluminates have progressively converted to monocarbo aluminates, but the hydrate phase as such formed in this uh, new binder system tend to be stable. So, this ensures that the hydrate phases tend to have certain level of stability in such conditions, right. Also you can observe uh, as uh, someone was asking before, so this is a calcium hydroxide peak in fly ash, but when you start looking at around 4 years, you do not see much calcium hydroxide because fly ash would have reacted by now and consume most of the portlandite which is available, right. Also you can see ettringite also which is uh, nearly at stable and much higher amount in the case of uh, calcine clay system.